uh, put on the ballot and passed. So him and Mario and Jessica are great advocates here for the state, uh, for this plant. So thank you for all your dedication uh, to this plant and helping the patients get their medicine. So thank you for being here, Tyler. Thank you for having me. I, I, uh, I'm a big fan of cannabis. I, I wouldn't want to compare myself to Mario, though. He's pretty, pretty <laughs> awesome work there. Yeah. So, um, my name's Tyler Hacking. It's nice to have all of you here today. Thanks for having me. Um, I spent the last 20 years in the cannabis industry. I went on my first farm when I was 14, and my friend Wes, he said, hey man, come out to California with me. And, so my mom was gonna go work on an apple farm. <laughs> Didn't see her for a while. <laughs> and I learned all sorts of cool stuff. So I come from the, you know, part of my past is the same place as you, Northern California. And Never asked why the pies didn't get sent home. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I spent a lot of time in Mendocino County, Humboldt County, and just bouncing around different farms. I used to sit on the side of the road with a sign that I, I drew some scissors on with uh, permanent markers so I could get trimming yeah, jobs, trimming. you know, yeah, <laughs> so you make friends that way, and, and I was lucky enough to learn from some really cool people, and I, I continued from there to go to Washington, Oregon, I was in Colorado the first four years of their legalization, um, and I wound up back here to go back to school, I, I hit a point where I couldn't learn much more in the environment I was in, and I wanted to pursue an academic career. And now I'm finishing my botany degree at UVU. It's super awesome. Yeah. And I just finished my research project on cannabis use and its impacts on other drug use and uh, health conditions and success. And the results are really interesting. Um, the part that pertains to extraction and concentration, my topic today was interesting and it comes from one of the questions that we asked the subjects that we surveyed. We were asking them what type of cannabis they use. Most people use flour, but over 50% of people also use edibles and oil. So extracts are a very popular form of consumption for cannabis. Um, extraction of cannabis goes really far back in history. It started, to my knowledge, in India. Um, they would actually use their precious silk and put cannabis colas on it and they would tap the side of it. You can actually find videos of this on YouTube if you look for it. And they would have uh, trays below. And by the end of you know them doing this, they would have mounds of keef, right? And if you compress keef together, you get hash. Um, you, can, you can make hash without heat, but most people heat it up a little bit too. They'll put it between two hot plates and then tie things around it and, and compress it into a hash brick. Anybody right? else not water? <laughs> <laughs> so the first hash I ever made was it's called bubble hash, and essentially you're taking these micron screens. Have you ever, uh, on, on face masks, you know how they're stopping the particles from coming in? They're using very specific sizes of, of screens. Um, I wanted to compare it to like a, a window screen, right, but much smaller and finer. And based on the size of the holes in that screen will determine what makes it through that screen, okay? Different uh, cannabinoids and terpenes and plant material, they are, they are different sizes, okay? And the trichomes themselves, when they break off, they can be anywhere between about 20, well, technically one, all, all the way up to about 200, 240 microns in size. So I, I usually transition between those levels. I, I'll, I'll layer it, you know, I'll put a 25 micron in the bottom, 60, 90, 120, up to the 200s, right? And that way I can get a variety of material extracted, okay? and, and um, the reason I'm mentioning this separation technique is because you can do it with water, bubble hash like I was talking about, or you can do it with dry ice, which is CO2, by the way. And organic chemistry is defined by the presence of carbon. By definition, CO2 is organic, and you can use it to extract from cannabis in a way that does not provide toxicity at all. It doesn't have any <coughs> byproducts of that, of that technique, okay? Um, I love dry ice. I've extracted a lot of hash with dry ice. It's one of the simplest ways, in my opinion, and I don't like using water 
because then you have to deal with getting rid of the water, right? And so in my mind, dry ice is just perfect. Um, and then you can take that material and you can add it into butter. Um, you can, you, you still need to put it in the oven if you're gonna eat it because you have to decarboxylate it, right? Um, the dry ice or other solvents will not decarboxylate it. Um, and let's Could talk you about tell that. Every, yeah, yeah, thank you. So, so some of the phytocannabinoids, for example, THCA, it's not bioavailable because of its physical shape. It can't attach to the receptor in your body. That receptor is a certain shape, okay? And when you rip the A off, all of a sudden, it is the right shape and it can fit in that receptor. That's called decarboxylation, okay? It's ripping the acetyl group off of the THC, the CBD. So CBDA is another example. If you want to have that CBD be bioavailable, it can't have that acetyl group on it or it won't interact. It'll just come out as waste, essentially. Um, that's why a lot of edibles don't work for people um, because they didn't decarboxylate it. They didn't take it to specific temperatures and, and durations in the oven in order to have that effect, okay? And so it's kind of like unlocking the medicine. Um, you underheat it or overheat it? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you can overdo it too. If, if you overheat it, you will actually break down the compound. Um, THC has a different decarboxylation boiling point than CBD does, for example, because they have different weights. It's a good way to put that. Um, and the, the reason I mention that is because if you're going to make stuff at home, you want to make sure to decarboxylate it or it's not going to work. If you're working with fresh plant material, it's going to be a insignificant percentage of the medicine that you have if you did decarboxylate it. Okay. Um, I really like your infusion. Uh, lipid infusion is awesome. MCT oil specifically is really great because it has a lot of places to attach to. That's a good way to put it, right? Yeah. So you, you can achieve bioavailability and concentration because of and I'm trying not to use scientific terms, I'm sorry guys, I, I spend a lot of time around biologists and stuff and they make you use certain terms, so. Uh, we, we call them covalent bonds, okay? And so these, these fats, these lipids, they're in a structure where they have more covalent bonds, more places for things to attach to. And that maximizes how concentrated that dose can be. And, and also the other things that can attach to it, like he was mentioning the terpenes like that so I'm a big fan of using oils and butters different oils and butter have different potential for infusion it's a good way to put it so um, you can max out that potential it doesn't happen very often it requires quite a lot of plant material so don't be afraid of you know adding in as much as you want um, I could bounce around all night. Uh, is there anything you guys have any particular questions about <laughs> when it comes to extraction? And he's talking about doing this at home because yeah. you can. Yeah, you, you can don't bring your own stuff equipment. home and actually do this. Under the bill, yeah. we're allowed to buy our little gelatins and they have to be in a cute form. But nothing nothing doesn't say that you can't bring that product home and make your own with anything. Mm -hmm. you know and I, mean? I would argue that in some instances, you can get a better product that way. There are some methods like what these guys are doing that you can't replicate without specific equipment, okay? That being said, I was faced with this problem in my teens, and I was lucky enough to be around a lot of people who had figured it out already, right? And there's a lot of stuff you can do at home without, without equipment. Um, and I'm happy to talk about this, but I need to give a disclaimer that it involves using specific legal and easily purchasable hazardous chemicals and you need to be aware before you use them that they are dangerous they're labeled that way for a reason they're flammable they could be potentially explosive don't put them next to a fire stove okay if you're gonna go get a bottle of everclear for example keep the lid on it right i know people who have been hurt sense. that way and it it kills people. Yeah, um, you just gave me a bad flashback to high school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jungle had juice. a few of those experiences in there. <laughs> I'm lucky to be <laughs> here, you know? So, when it comes to CO2, just <laughs> leave it with that and the material you're working with. Don't, don't add in anything else, okay? Some people will mix in ice with their CO2, but really that's not an effective technique, I would argue. Um, and and uh, that, that's the dry ice extract I was yeah. talking to you guys about. Um, 
Another one that you can do at home is just simple infusion. You can take butter, you can take olive oil, you can take coconut oil, and mix it with plant material. Take that on the stove, let it let it sit for a while, um, and and Unless you live in use a food. Like me. <laughs> yeah, use a food thermometer. My magical butter machine. <laughs> yep. Use a food thermometer. Same thing. And look up an alkaloid uh, phytocannabinoid chart, okay, a decarboxylation chart. You, if you if you type that in online, you'll be able to find one, and it'll show you different temperatures to take it to based on the alkaloid or sorry, the phytocannabinoid you're using. If um, if you wanted to infuse THC into your butter, you can do that. If you wanted to infuse CBD into your butter, you can do that, or into olive oil. But get a food thermometer, an electric one, they're not that much, totally worth it. And then you can take it to that specific temperature for that specific amount of time for it to be medical. You don't want to waste that medicine, it's expensive. And I can't tell you how many processes waste medicine, and that sucks. You want to maximize that, right? But once again, you're, you're at home, so don't, don't go overboard, you know? Um, I heard of a guy that put alcohol in a pressure cooker. <laughs> Shit. Oh. Yeah. Things like that. Just be safe, okay? And, uh, and, and, and so that's the other one is, is alcohol. Um, I love doing ethyl extracts. I think alcohol is beautiful. It's a really nice solvent in my opinion. Um, specifically, it, okay, that depends on the alcohol you're working with. Let me reiterate. I would suggest using things like Everclear. Everclear is awesome. You can buy it by the gallon here now, which is really convenient. Before they always had them little. little yeah, now you can get the big one. It's and, all coming up. Oh man, so I like it because it sanitizes everything. It, it kills anything it touches microbially, so you don't. You're not at risk for E. coli, and there is E. coli on cannabis in medical pharmacies in the United States right now. Um, and that's that's from using bad compost in, in the crops, right? Um, but to come back to the, the alcohol, I love alcohol because you can if you can leave the lid off and it will just evaporate out. It's literally just a concentration of hydrogen, right? And, and hydrogen, if you leave it out in ambient air, it will evaporate. You can add on a little bit of heat, right? Not on a flame stove, <laughs> let's be really clear about that. On an electric stove, you can, but just put it on low and, and it will evaporate out without damaging your phytocannabinoids. Because once again, if you take the temperature too high, you're gonna degrade and burn and break down those cannabinoids. You're gonna destroy your medicine. And so you use a low heat to get rid of that hydrogen. And, and I'm telling you, if you do it correctly, you will not taste alcohol when you're done. No. Um, not at all. It does, hydrogen doesn't really have like a flavor like that unless it's in a concentrated form. Um, so I, I love alcohol. Uh, here, here. Yeah, don't, don't use isopropyl or anything like that. It's not something that you wanna consume after you've used it. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Those are some of my favorite ones. And then you can also buy a, a press machine. Uh, you can buy a used one and convert it, uh, or you could just buy a brand one online. And essentially, there are these two steel plates, right? And one's being held in the position here, and the other one is being pumped down or pumped up, right? And they're, they're heated, and what happens is when you have plant material in there and you squeeze it, you get a material that comes out called rosin, which is really magic. Live resin. <laughs> yeah, it's a way, a, way, a way of saying like terpenes mixed with plant oil is kind of a, a fancy way to say it. It's, it's the resin of the plant, which is the oil and volatile oil. Yeah, yes. terpenes. And, Definitely. Yeah. The good the resin, not the gross kind you find in the Yeah. Product, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that brings us back to, <laughs> to the fundamentals of extraction. So let's talk about you know what extraction means and what concentration means. So extraction is taking something out of something else. Just as simple as that. You could apply that term to a billion other things, right? A billion contexts. Uh, concentration. Once you've extracted, what you have extracted is concentrated because you have more of that by ratio here than you did in its original form when it was mixed with what it had been extracted from. Does that make sense? So it's all about the concentration. Um, a concentrate has a higher ratio of concentration than its original form. That's a really good way to describe How, that. I guess that brings me to a question I'm dying to get answered. Is 
how do you test the concentration? Like if you're taking an edible and it says 25 milligrams, or mm. how, how or where? Or I usually just eat it. No, I mean. <laughs> 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 so if you guys need a guinea lab, pig, you can nice. call me. Patient zero here. I'll be right over there. Sure no. Like you're putting in your brownies. Well, you can you can trust what's on on the label, right? But if you if you made an extract from your own plant material, you would have to get a COA, a certificate of analysis from a laboratory that can analyze that. And that analysis requires machinery that's very expensive and people who are trying to use it, right? So I I ship off for most of my testing. I only do a few tests at my house because it's just the cost of that is too high. It's probably two to four hundred dollars somewhere in that range. It does to do bring a test, a bit. to do it, to and it's, it's based on test. the complexity yeah. of the phytocannabinoids and terpenes you're looking at, right? Like I can do one um, right now, and it's it's only about seventy five is a good average seventy five dollars per uh, phytocannabinoid, right? And that's that's just my home kit, but the labs they can beat that price, right? Um, based on the kind of test you're doing. Um, so mine's more applicable, like if you're trying to find out if your crop is going hot or not, if it's gonna go over the THC percentage, I can come out and tell you that day, right? Uh, as far as a product, I would go through a laboratory because then you have a receipt from this laboratory. Whoa, God, oh, gee whiz, I hope that's okay. I did that with my mind. Uh, <laughs> is it okay? Yeah, oh, good. Ooh, that fine. laboratory's report is your report. You know, that laboratory's report is vouching for your product. So use another laboratory. Use a third party. It actually makes your product look better, look non-biased. You don't want to do your own testing because you can fudge your own testing results essentially. So having someone else say this, these are the results. You can confer with this company. Um, some products will actually put a link on the bottom of their product that says go to this site to see our test results. So they would actually come to your house and see like for, for your, for your you would send, you would mail it to them. Yeah, you would mail it yeah. out. Yeah, they don't come to your house. <laughs> yeah. I'm all yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, You would mail it in. Go ahead. There's a place in Utah County that will Yep. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. 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 there's uh, A-R-U-L, uh, A-R-L, and then there's um, the BYU lab, I'm trying to talk them into doing it, we'll so, see. I know the building that it's in, but I don't know I'm the trying. Name. What's that? Sorry. I know the building that it's in, down in Utah County, but I don't know the name of the building. There's a few that are testing in Utah like County. Like, uh, it's a yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like ARUP is for sure. <laughs> and then yeah, aromatics plant research is also. A, I got yeah. Can, I mean, you're my boy. I know who you are and stuff like that. Can you let these guys know a little bit about Green Dreams? I mean, oh, yeah. I totally forgot about that. Them. Know that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I own a consulting business. I'm a cannabis consultant. Um, after learning all of that stuff, I decided the thing I wanted to do the most was help people to be successful because this industry has a 90% fail rate. It's crazy. crazy. And, and, and honestly, heartbreaking. Like, I've gotten to know these people. They put their homes on mortgage to get business loans. <coughs> Some of them have committed suicide. You know, and, and it's serious. People are risking a lot in this industry and some of it works out for some people but not for everybody you know and, and it's really sad and so just I've, I've seen the impact that this knowledge can have compared to someone doing it their first time and it's exponential it's, it's huge right um, I've seen someone grow a plant their first season and it, and it wasn't very big and, and the same uh, a different person used the same genetics right and grew a monster is, is a good example of what I'm talking about, okay? And these agricultural techniques, they're very specific. Cannabis is a weird plant because its biology is, it wants to die. I don't know how else to put it. It's, it's a herbaceous <laughs> plant, it's dioecious, it's sexual, and it goes through a photo cycle, except for autoflowers, and it gets to a point hormonally where it goes through what's called senescence, cell, programmed cell death, and it, it ripens, right? Because the seeds are in a cola, which is technically a fruit, like a receptacle, kind of like a, a strawberry is a good way. The, the seeds are actually a and the, the seeds on strawberries are also a king, so it's a really good comparison. So we're all really, anybody growing cannabis is a, is a fruit farmer, a seedless fruit farmer, hopefully. 
Um, and I've grown so many plants that it just became work eventually, you know. Not in Utah. <laughs> not, not in Utah. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, mostly in California. And, and, and I tried to calculate one time, and it got into the hundreds of thousands of it. I don't know, because some of them were like thousands of acres, you know, and, and they were really big projects, right? And so it got to the point where I, I enjoy experimental cultivation, but other than, you know, growing for my own medicine, I wouldn't be interested in cultivation anymore. But I know that that information is super valuable, and so I wanted to use it to help other people, and it's had that impact. Um, my clients are all repeat clients. They call me back. They give me the best feedback. Um, they tell me that the impact of not only my consultation, but the work I do with them as a result of that is significant in them being successful. Um, now I'm starting a soil business, which is great. Uh, yeah. Because the root of most agricultural issues is the soil, and soil can be expensive, and so my goal with this business is to keep the price as low as possible, but to give people the tool that they need to grow this plant in a competitive way. The average per plant yield last year in 2019 in Utah was a quarter pound. And it's honestly laughable. It's a super low amount of yield. Yeah. It really is. And those well, are the plants cute. that survived, right? Yeah. <laughs> those, are, those are the ones that made it through. Right. And hemp plants, and I'll use that term loosely, they can average at a good two or three pounds if you know what you're doing. Even here in Utah's climate, I know people that grew hemp last year and are doing it this year that are getting two to three pounds per plant right now. And so it's all about how you're doing this. And those those techniques are very specific and I've obsessed over them over the last 20 years and learning any that I didn't know and it's helped me a lot to be successful at what I'm doing. And um, yeah, I, I, do you mind if I talk about my research real quick? You that I just did? Yeah. Green Dreams in your soil? Um, yeah, so Green Dreams Come True is my consultation business. Green Dreams Organic will be my soil business, and I'm, I'm gonna have partners, so I decided to do a second mm -hmm. business for that, yeah. But um, we're gonna try to buy everybody's destroyed material. A lot of the farmers in Utah, a lot of my clients had to destroy their material because it went over the yeah. point three 